In this video, I'm gonna show you how to compose themes that fly. In order to do this, we're gonna look at John Powell's flying theme from How to Train Your Dragon. We're gonna look at concepts like modes, chord progressions, cadences, repetition and contrast, how you can use repetition and contrast to really create soaring moments in your themes and have much more steady ones. We're gonna talk about some more advanced music theory concepts like harmonic rhythm and even chromatic medians, which is one of Hollywood's most commonly used chord tricks to get that iconic Hollywood sound. So without further ado, let's listen to this theme, both the A and B theme together, which come together to create the flying theme for all three films in the How to Train Your Dragon series. Let's take a listen and then we're gonna break it down. Okay, so before we really dive into the theme and start looking at the actual notes that are being played, I want to take a step back and take a brief moment to talk about the philosophy of theme writing. Now, this is something which is really important to consider. It's really tempting to just hop straight into your theme writing, but it's important to think about what we're writing and what is the purpose of what we're writing. And in the case of John Powell composing a flying theme here, we really need to think about how this represents Hiccup's character. Because movie writing and theme writing for the purpose of movies and TV shows and video games really is about storytelling. And so what's going on here over the course of this first film, this is the first time that we're introduced to this theme, is Hiccup's really growing and coming into his own. In the beginning of the movie, he's really timid and shy and unsure of himself. Maybe not shy, but he's very timid and unsure of himself. And as his relationship with Toothless grows and he becomes more confident in who he is, we get more introduced into the second half of the theme, the B theme, which in contrast to the A theme, really soars and flies and is filled with confidence. So it's important to remember here that as John was composing this theme, part of what creates that sense of flying and soaring feeling that you get in the second half is the contrast to how timid and for lack of a better term, basic, the A theme is. So in order to understand what I mean by that, let's hop back over into MuseScore and take a look at the themes more in depth. So here we are in MuseScore and let's look just at the A theme. Now the A theme, let's talk about the different ways that this theme is basic and see what I mean by that. Now, when I use the term basic, I wanna be very clear. I'm not saying that there's something um, not interesting or not musical about this or that John Powell was lazy or writing a bad theme. I think this is very, very intentional and very smart theme writing. So some of the things that are basic about this theme are that we're in 4-4, four, four, we're using a major key, and there's a lot of repetition. And on top of that, the chord choices here, there's only the use of three different chords. There's the one chord, the four chord, and the five chord all of which are major chords and probably are the three most commonly used chords in a major key. And the use of the four and five chords allow us to have plagal and authentic cadences, which is the most well-known cadence to the ear in the history of classical music. The authentic cadence is sort of the cadence. So this is really basic in many senses. This doesn't feel like it's going anywhere super far from home. And on top of that, John is using a pedal tone, D, is the only note that is used in the bass. Everything is either a D major chord or a slash chord. We either get a D, a G over D, or an A over D. So in this sense, we're we do feel really timid. Now it doesn't feel super dark, we're not in minor. Hiccup's character is the main character, he's the protagonist, he's the hero of this journey. We're not trying to create something which sounds dark or necessarily ominous but we are trying to create something that feels like it has a lot of room to grow and is a little bit unsure of itself. So let's take a look at what's going on here. 
you know, many themes, the most basic theme writing, when you get started learning how to compose themes, everyone will tell you to compose an eight bar theme. You start with the first four bars and then you have the second four bars. Everything is sort of divisible, very repetitive, very symmetrical. And that's what's going on here. As we look at the first two bars of our theme, we start on our one chord. We start on D major. We start with two half notes, followed by a quarter note, quarter note, half note. You know, rhythmically speaking, this theme isn't super complex. And like I said, we're just going from one to the four over one, back to the one, using this very common plagal cadence sound. Now, so in and of itself, this theme doesn't actually sound like it's really started to go anywhere yet. When we think of theme writing, as we get into our B theme, we're gonna see that in order to go somewhere, in order to have a sense of flying, we need to move somewhere away from home. But we're not really doing much movement away from home. Everything about this feels super, super D major. And the other thing to notice here is the amount of stepwise motion or small steps. We don't have huge leaps in the first eight bars. We start on the major third in the melody on this F sharp. We go up stepwise to a G, E, G, F sharp. We don't have a ton of movement. And if we look at the next two bars, this is an exact repetition with one exception. We've got a quarter note rest instead of a half note. But otherwise, the notes that are being played here and the chords are going to be the exact same as what we've already heard. So this is using an ever so slight change to continue the theme. And we've got this back-to-back -back plagal cadence, which feels like it hasn't gone very far from home, has a lot of room to grow. As we move into the second half of our theme here, we'll notice that things do begin to move a little bit, but not too much. We are introduced to some new rhythms. We've got this rest quarter note, quarter note, quarter note rhythm going on in the fifth bar with our four over one, which is a chord we've heard before. But next in bar six, we hear a five over one, the five chord being one that we haven't heard yet. We're also highest in register, and we're also introduced to this dotted quarter note. Now, when it comes to creating a sense of movement in music, and I think that that's a lot of what flying music is, using dotted quarter notes, dotted eighth notes, particularly when you're in 4-4, but it doesn't really matter what time signature you're using, using these dotted notes to create a little bit of bounce in the music is going to really help bring it to life. So as we get into bar five and six, we are introduced to our first dotted quarter note, and we resolve right back down into the one chord. This right here is an authentic cadence. We're going from four to five to one. This is the, like the cadence, right? Now, there are a few things that make this not a perfect authentic cadence, but we don't need to worry about that for now. This is an authentic cadence. And then we get an almost exact repetition in bars seven and eight with a few slight differences. One being that in bar eight, in order to end the A theme, instead of just an A chord, we have an A dominant seven chord, which is even more a reference to the authentic cadence. When we think about the first cadence that we learn about, it is, I would be willing to bet the first cadence that everyone learns about is going to be the dominant seven five chord resolving back into the major one chord. And that's exactly what we've got here. Now, because of the D pedal tone and because of the fact that we are resolving down to an F sharp in the melody, this isn't a perfect authentic cadence, but there's a reason for that, and I'll talk about it more in a little bit. But what I want to draw your attention to is another thing, which is focus on the repetition here. This is incredibly, incredibly repetitive. And one thing that you might have missed is let's look at the end of every second bar. Now, like I said, we kind of have a reference to a cadence every two bars here. We're not going super far from home. But how does bar two end on our first plagal cadence? Well, it's a half note on F sharp on our D chord. What about bar four? It's the same thing. What about bar six? It's the same thing. And what about bar eight? It's the same thing. We're always ending every two bars right back to our one chord. So when we think about what I was talking about when it comes to the philosophy of theme writing, let's put ourselves and try and put ourselves in John Powell's shoes. And I don't want to claim that he was thinking all of these things. I'm just trying to imagine what he might have been thinking. And I think that this is a great way to keep this theme a little timid. Every time it begins to go somewhere, it goes, no, 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 let's not get moving too fast. Let's come right back home. 
And in this way, with the repetition we've created, with the use of very basic chords and very basic theme writing, we've created an A theme which is memorable because of how rep repetitive it is and also really creates the ability for contrast as we move into the B theme so that the B theme can really, really, really come to life. So with all of that said about the A theme, let's listen to just the A theme again before we dive into our B theme. Okay, so that was the A theme. Now let's look at the B theme. This is the memorable one. This is the theme that's used in Test Drive, the epic cue. This is where the life comes into this theme. This is where the flying happens. Now, let's just talk for a moment about the philosophy of writing the B theme here. A lot of this is about Hiccup's relationship with Toothless, but really at the end of the day, it's about Hiccup himself and his growth as a character. He's becoming more confident in himself confident in his place in the world, and also feeling this connection with this animal who becomes his best friend over the course of the film, and their bond is over the freedom they feel in flying together. So trying to put ourselves in John's shoes, what we're trying to do here is represent what it feels like to have a moment as a teenager where all of a sudden things click. Your place in the world makes sense. You form a really strong bond with someone that you didn't necessarily know was possible. You get out of your home and start to feel like your own person. So this isn't necessarily going to be a super mature theme. This isn't someone later on in life. Um, this is still a young person, but this is a big growing up moment, and this is meant to be really heroic and triumphant. So. As we dive into the theme, let's keep those things in mind. So let's, again, just start with the first two bars. Now, at the end of the day, I should say, before we get into the first two bars, this really is an eight bar theme again. You'll see that it's actually 10 bars, but the final two bars are just a repetition of bars seven and eight. Um, and we'll, we'll get into a little bit of why John Powell chose to do that. But let's just remember that this is still just an eight bar theme. It's nothing crazy. Uh, it, there's nothing sort of weird going on here or super fancy. We are sticking in 4-4. Four, four. We're, we're still in D major. But as we dive into bars 9 and 10, also 1 and 2 of the B theme, we'll notice a couple of things. The first thing is that we're introduced to our first minor chord. Now, this is going to be the sixth chord, B minor, in D major. Now, as far as common chord progressions go in pop music, what are the four chords that if you go on YouTube and search four chord song, what are you going to get? You're going to get one, five, six, four. The In a major key, the one chord, the four chord, the five chord, and the six chord are by far the most commonly used chords in music. These are going to be super accessible to every listener, no matter their age. Whilst at the same time, we introduce this minor six chord, which creates contrast to the A theme because there were no minor chords. And all of a sudden there's a sense of seriousness here. There is a little bit of maturing and growing up from Hiccup. And part of his growth, and maybe I'm reading something that isn't necessarily there in John's mind, but part of his growth as a character, if you watch the film, is he kind of becomes more serious. He starts to take the world a little bit more seriously as he begins to find his place. So starting on this sixth chord, having it be our first minor chord, the first time that we have a note other than D in the bass, it really feels like, okay, we've really gone somewhere. Um, let's see where this goes. So the first two bars are going to take us through this really common chord progression that you hear in all types of music, not just film music. We go from the minor six to the major four to the major five back to the major one. This is a very common chord progression. But despite the fact that we have completely changed the chord progression, um, changed the harmonic rhythm. We've changed from going to a chord change sort of uh, a little bit more sporadically and a little bit uh, uh, unevenly. It wasn't always at, at the exact same pace. We've now gone to this point where every half note, there is a new chord. We've found a consistent harmonic rhythm and we've also sped up our harmonic rhythm. 
So there is contrast in that way. We've John you created a lot of contrast in using these techniques. But let's talk about how this feels like part of the same theme. And this is the repetition. Now, one thing I want you to notice is how does this theme start? Well, it starts half note, half note. How did our first theme start? How did the A theme start? If we go all the way back to the beginning, we've got half note, half note. Now, let me zoom out a little bit so I don't have to make everyone dizzy as I scroll back and forth. What's going on in bar 10? Well, we've got dotted quarter note, eighth note, half note. Where have we seen that before? Well, we've seen it in bar six. We've seen this rhythm, exactly. This right here is something that we're familiar with. It's gonna sound familiar to the ear. And that's because we've heard it before. So this is an important thing to remember. And I think it is one of the most, I know from my speaking absolutely from personal experience, but also having watched other tutorials online, this is one of the most common pieces of advice I hear. And it's one that I think is worth just ramming home over and over again, which is that in order for your themes to feel unified, and to have that real emotional weight that you're looking for, you need repetition. It doesn't necessarily have to be a certain type of repetition, but there needs to be repetition in strategic ways. Otherwise, it's gonna sound like a scrambled run-on sentence. So we do have this repetition here. And once again, we're functioning in sort of two-bar increments that come together, the first two bars, then the second two bars, those two bars come together to create the first four bars, which are sort of their own thing. The second four bars are sort of their own thing, but those can be very easily divided down into two bars. I hope that makes sense. Everything here is just very symmetrical and repetitive in that way. And so if we look for re repetition, we just repeat this chord progression. We go from the minor six to the, that's the wrong chord. <laughs> Let me delete that, that should be four. We go from the minor six to the major four to the major five, back to the major one. This is an exact repeat. Now, what's different here on this second repetition is that we have, for the first time, a big leap in our music. And how is John doing this? Well, he's starting down here on this A and going up to this A. And this is all being done over this G major chord. So. One of the things that I think is a necessity in flying and soaring music, something maybe not a necessity, that might be too strong of a word, but when you look at flying themes, something you're gonna see a lot is at some point, if in a very short period of time, there's gonna be a leap of an octave. This big leap is gonna be associated with the feeling of soaring and sort of rising. If you can imagine Hiccup on his dragon with Toothless and they're flying at some point in order to get this feeling of flying and soaring and heroicness that we're looking for, there needs to be this big leap up. And so up to this point, we have had a lot of very small steps, stepwise motion, which is phenomenal for creating themes which feel fluid and consistent. But now we've introduced our first sort of non-standard, just basic minor or major triad. We've got this G major nine, and we've got this big leap. So we've introduced some new things to create contrast, which gives it a sense of flying. But once again, we still do have repetition here because if we imagine that this tied quarter note here on this F sharp was just a rest, well, have we seen this rest quarter, quarter, quarter before? Well, we have, we saw it on bars seven and on bars five. This is not new. Once again, this part is not new. The, the, the rhythm of the melody is not new. Now the notes that are being played and the gap that's being covered as we go from A to F sharp to A is new. And the chord, we haven't seen this G major nine before is new, but there's also repetition. And once again, we go into the same exact, the bar 12 here is going to be the same exact thing as bar 10. Now the difference being that this note doesn't tie into bar 13 as we move towards our cadence, but Bars nine through 12 here, one through four of the B theme, just really take note at how much contrast and repetition and how if you look at everything, almost no matter what aspect of this you're looking at, it's not, none of it's random. It's either very intentional use of contrast or very intentional use of repetition. We've got lots of stepwise movement in order to create a memorable moving theme. We've got this big leap of an octave, of an octave which is really going to make the theme fly. So now I just want to listen to just bars 9 through 12. Pay attention to some of those things. Try and see how listening to this makes you feel. So
So as we move towards the end of this theme, let's talk about how to end a theme in a heroic and triumphant way, because there's a lot going on towards the end of this theme. So as we move into bar 13 here, things start to get a little bit crazy. We're starting to wind down for this cadence. And one of the ways that John indicates that we're winding down for this cadence is that we've got a really sort of new uh, rhythmic bar going on here in bar 13. There's a lot of eighth notes here. There is the one quarter note. And we do start again on this B minor, but then we go to the minor three chord in D major, which is going to be F sharp minor. Now this is different than the G major chord that we have been going to. So you might sort of think, well, what's going on here? How does he come to that decision? Is it just random? Because he does go right back to this A chord, the five chord, but then he does something which is one of the classic Hollywood film tricks that he hasn't done yet in this, in this theme. Up until this point, everything has been diatonic. And what I mean by that, if you're not familiar with that word, is that every chord, every note that's been played has been within the key of D major. E major is not in the key of D major. E is, and the note E is, and the note B is, but in D major, there exists a G, not a G sharp. An E major requires a G sharp. So we have a G sharp in this E major chord, which is not in D major. So this is using a borrowed chord, using a chord from outside of your key is going to be a very, very common film music trick. So how do you decide which chord to use? Well, there's a bajillion different ways to do this, but let's look at these two bars and think about what's, what's going on here. So what I wanna quickly reference you to is let's just look at the first half of bar 14 here. Dotted quarter note on the E, up to the quarter note, excuse me, up to the eighth note on this F sharp. Well, where have we seen that before? We've seen that a lot. We have referenced this as we've moved into the second bar of our two bar phrases a lot. E, F sharp, E, F sharp. We have seen this a lot. Our ear knows, knows where this is going. We could not be more confident that this is gonna go back to the D, that we are going to end this on an F sharp half note. You know why? Because we've seen this on bar 12. We've seen this on bar 10. We've seen this on bar eight. I can go all the way back to the beginning on bar six, on bar four, and on bar two. We've seen this everywhere. Our ear knows for certain where this is going, but all of a sudden we don't go there. We go from this F sharp and we go somewhere different. So where do we go? Well, we go down a fifth. What, what, which note is F sharp the fifth of, well, that would be B. So we fall down this fifth, which is going to be an incredibly, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Satisfying, it's going to be an incredibly satisfying resolution. And how do we harmonize it? Well, we harmonize it with this E major chord, which is the two chord, would be the major two in D major. And now that might seem a little bit random still. You're still like, okay, but how does he get to this E major chord? Well, part of it is sometimes things are just a little bit random, but I want to frame this from another perspective, which is that the use of this F sharp minor here is interesting because if we think about the relative minor, and I know that this is getting a little bit complex, so if this doesn't, if you're at a point where you don't understand what I'm about to say, don't worry about it. Um, you can still think of things as just being in D major and that he's just using the major two. That's okay. But another thing that's I think is interesting and that's helpful in looking at this section is that if we think about B minor, just for a moment, as not being our minor six chord, but as being our home key, which it's not, but let's just imagine that it is, that it's our minor one. Well, in B minor, which is the relative minor of D major, so all the notes are going to be the same as D major, the progression from B minor to F sharp minor to A major in a minor key is the minor one to the minor five to the major seven. Now, those three chords are used a, a bunch in, in writing minor key chord progressions. So our ear, here's this B minor, F sharp minor, A, and we know we're in D major, so we're kind of doing the six, three, five, but we're also at the same time, and this is where modes are so interesting and so tricky, um, and this is where it's so up to interpretation what mode you're in. We're going, at the same time, we're making use of a really, really common chord progression in minor keys. We're going from one to five to major seven. And where to go after that 
is a really, really common Hollywood film trick, which is the major four chord in minor. This back and forth between minor one to major four is one that is so associated with Hollywood film music. It is so associated with heroicness, epicness, triumphantness, any sort of positive emotion that you want to feel in, in movie music. It's so associated with otherworldliness existing in the land of fantasy. The minor one to major four is one of, if not like the Hollywood um, uh, chord changes. It's used all the time. So I think thinking about this as being a sort of minor chord progression where we're continuing the use of a chord progression, we're just changing it a little bit, going from minor one, minor five, major seven, down to the four chord, which should be minor, but instead we're making it major to go at that Hollywood sound. All of a sudden now, this theme, which has been really using a lot of very diatonic notes, we've been using chord progressions that we hear in pop music, now there's this big reference to film, cinema, and Hollywood triumphantness. And this feeling that is something which you maybe aren't gonna see as commonly in pop music, there's this reference to, okay, we are in a movie. This is about character growth here. This is about storytelling. And there's the use of this E major chord. And we also get this nice fall down a fifth. And then we move into our cadence. So from E major, we go back to G major, which is the four chord. And then we get this very classic cadence style, which is wherever, sort of wherever you're at melodically, you just start falling down in eighth notes or 16th notes or whatever it is. You just fall, you fall, fall, fall into your cadence, right? And our ear once again knows where this is going because we have this E major chord here, right? But we're falling. We've seen this eighth note. We've seen this falling a series of eighth notes with, with an A here lead us right back down to an F sharp half note. We have seen it before. Where have we seen it before? Well, that's how we ended our A theme. A, F sharp. So once again, our ear is sort of expecting to this to go down to an F sharp, but instead we go back up to the B. Now, this works for a lot of reasons. One is that we've just heard this E major chord. So there's a reference to a chord we've just heard. Another is that this is, this is stepwise motion. As far as cadences go, the use of stepwise motion as you lead into your cadence is going to be incredibly common. Um, and the other thing is that this is a chromatic median. Now, what is a chromatic median? The idea is that if you pick a chord, any chord, you move a third away. It could be a minor or major third and you move to a chord quality, which is not naturally found in your home keys uh, list of chords. That was a lot of words. So let me, let me try and just explain this with an example. If we're in C major, right, using all the white notes on our keyboard, and we move up a minor third to E flat, that note doesn't exist in the key of C major. So we've moved a third away from our home note, and we've picked a chord which doesn't exist in C major. And so this seems really random, but one of the things about chromatic medians and one of the reasons why they always work is because they're always going to have, not always, almost always they're going to have shared notes. So when you move from C major to E flat major, well, what's the shared note? It's going to be G. When you move from E major to G major, well, what's the shared note? It's going to be the B. So because of these shared notes, these chromatic medians are going to be great ways to transition between chords. And this is one, again, one of the classics of the Hollywood sound. So John Powell, instead of resolving back down into the one chord, I think that there's a very intentional use of this chromatic median Hollywood sound. If we think of, again back to the philosophy of writing this theme and what John Powell's after, this is triumphant. This is heroic. There's no ifs or buts about it. This is just, this is what it is. Like this is Hiccup having his moment in the, in the movie. And towards the end, he obviously has to overcome the final challenge of fighting the big boss dragon. But as far as his character growth, this is really where it comes is with his connection with Toothless. So this has got to end on more than just a resolution back to our major one. We've done that before. That was timid Hiccup in the beginning in the A theme. So instead, we're gonna make reference to this major chord which exists outside of our home key. And because of this, it's gonna sound even more major. We're gonna use this chromatic median sound, um, which is associated with Hollywood, and it's gonna just be really big and triumphant. So instead of resolving back down into the F sharp, we go back up to the B, back up to our E major chord, which we've just heard here. 
Now, this can be thought of, again, as the major four chord of B minor, or you can think of it as the major two chord in D major. It doesn't really matter for right now. And in order to make sure the listener knows that this is the cadence, know like where this is where hiccup is now, this isn't just a continuation of the theme, this is a cadence, we repeat bars 15 and 16 again with a slight variation being that instead of just falling eighth notes, we have this quarter note on the C sharp and then we go down into 16th notes back up into our B. So there's a slight rhythmic variation, but other than that, bars 15 and 17 are the exact same um, and we end on the E major chord. And this repetition of bars creates this real sense of like, okay, this is a cadence. This is the end of our theme. So I hope you can see that just looking at this 18 bars of music, there's a lot to talk about. And the two key concepts, if I had to pick any, are repetition and contrast. Thinking about these and always being conscious of them is one of the absolute keys, in my opinion, to good theme writing. And it's one of the things that makes the greats really, really good, is that some of your favorite themes, I just have this experience all the time. I go to study a theme that I love, and I am just blown away at how much repetition there is. There's so much. And then the contrast that does exist feels so intentional, feels so smart, and it sounds so great musically. So I know that I talked about a lot of different things here, but if there's anything, yeah, I want to drive home, it's this idea of repetition, of contrast, and of intentionality. This can sound sort of like I'm just making things up, like, no, bro, music's just about, like, feel, man. You got to just feel it out, that sort of mentality, which I'm not saying there's anything inherently wrong with that. But I think when it comes to theme writing, I think it's okay to really sit down and be very intentional with how you're thinking about this and think about how music relates in theme writing to emotions and character progression and think about how we can use music and music theory to make the listener feel those things and relate to those things. And when you do all those things over and over again and you practice and you're incredibly skilled the way John Powell is, you create themes like this, which are beautiful and gorgeous and you can just listen to over and over and over and over again. Now, one final thing I should mention here is that in order to create themes which are soaring and flying and heroic, a lot of it is about what I've just talked about, being really intentional and really taking the time to get the theme down, to get the chords right and the notes right. But another really important thing, obviously, is going to be things like tempo, dynamics, and orchestration. I could orchestrate this, slow it down, and have it sound a little bit more somber and quiet, and it could be much more timid, even with the same notes playing. There are ways to orchestrate this, or John could orchestrate it, and he does throughout the movie. There are times he reharmonizes things or orchestrates themes in certain ways to take what were otherwise heroic themes and make them sound a little bit more sad, which can be an absolutely heartbreaking technique to take a theme which the listener has associated with being positive, make it sound sad. That's getting into get, getting more in depth than we need to for this video, but. I hope that that's interesting, and I hope that it's cool to look at a theme like this and be like, yeah, okay, I think that there was intention in every chord choice, in every repetition, in every use of contrast. There's so much going on here, and there's so much to learn from this theme, and I hope that some of it is helpful for you as you go about writing your own flying themes. That is going to be it for today's video. Once again, I really hope you learned something and found this interesting. If you did, please leave a like on the video and leave a comment. I would really, really appreciate it. That is it for now. Until next time, take care.